Yes, please. It's quite clear. So, All right. Thank you. So I think you can start. Thank you. Okay. So good evening once again. Um, this evening, as has been mentioned, we are continuing with the curriculum presentation, and I'll be taking us through um cardiogenic shock. Okay, so these are the learning objectives that we hope to achieve at the end of this presentation. Um, first of all, we want to be able to recognize and differentiate cardiogenic shock from other forms of shock states. We also want to understand the pathophysiology and the hemodynamics of cardiogenic shock. And lastly, we want to be able to investigate and manage appropriately um, cases of cardiogenic shock. So by way of introduction, cardiogenic shock, as we all know, is a medical emergency and is the leading cause of death in acute myocardial infarction with mortality rates as high as 70 to 90 percent in the absence of aggressive and highly experienced technical care. The keys to achieving a good outcome in a patient with cardiogenic shock are one, to make a rapid diagnosis, to start prompt supportive therapy, and also to be able to identify the underlying cause and then treat it appropriately. So in general, shock, regardless of the cause, is a physiological state that is characterized by a severe reduction in tissue perfusion. And this reduction in perfusion results in a decreased oxygen delivery to the cells. And as a result, the cells um, tend to anaerobic metabolism and also leads to activation of inflammatory cascade and cellular injury which if not interrupted can lead to death of the cells, systems, or the patient. So all forms of shock are characterized by inadequate perfusion to meet the metabolic demands of the tissues. So we look at the various types of shock. So we have the genetic shock, um, which is a reduction in cardiac output, which the cause is usually of cardiac origin. Um, we also have hypovolemic shock, which results from a reduction in the effective circulating blood volume. And this can result from GI bleeding, really massive GI bleeding, severe diarrhea, vomiting, and also severe burns can all lead to hypovolemic shock. We also have obstructive shock, which results from impedance of circulation by an intrinsic or extrinsic obstruction. And this can be due to a massive pulmonary embolism, dissecting aneurysm, cardiac tamponade, and also can also result from tension pneumothorax. Lastly, we have distributive shock, distributive shock, um, which has three main components. That is septic shock, anaphylactic shock, and then neurogenic shock. And this is caused by conditions that produce direct arteriovenous shunting and is characterized by a decreased systemic venous resistance or increased venous capacitance because of visomotor, visomotor dysfunction. Sorry, just a minute. Okay. The shock in terms of the volume and then the flow. So for distributed shock, the volume is usually For obstructive shock, the flow is really at the wrong place. And then for cardiogenic shock, the flow is usually not enough. Um, this they can 
um, you can have a state where you have a combination of one or two of this type of shock. And that is called a shock of mixed etiology. So we're now zooming on cardiogenic shock. So cardiogenic shock is a physiologic state in which inadequate tissue perfusion will presence of adequate intravascular volume. So in this type of shock, usually there must be a cardiac dysfunction and there should also always be adequate intravascular volume. So what are the hemodynamic criteria in um, criteria in cardiogenic shock? Most often we have a low systolic BP of less than 90 millimeter of mercury which must be sustained for at least 30 minutes, not just a transient drop in BP, but must be sustained we, for sorry, we at need least to 30 minutes. I like uh, No record. Okay. Hello, sir. Sorry, sir. Are we recording, sir? Okay, yes, we are. Sir, we are. Sorry. Sorry. Oh. Okay, no problem. So like I said earlier, there must be a sustained hypotension of a solid DT of less than 90 millimeter of mercury. And this must go on for at least 30 minutes. Or a reduction in mean arterial pressure by 30 millimeter of mercury. Or a mean arterial pressure that is less than 65 millimeters of mercury. Um, there should also be a reduced cardiac index to less than 1.8 liter per minute per meter square without mechanical or pharmacological support or a cardiac index of less than 2.2 liter per minute per meter square um, when there is mechanical or pharmacological support. Um, as we all know, the cardiac index, normal cardiac index usually between 2.5 to 4 liter per minute per meter square. Um, there must also be a normal or elevated pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of usually above 15 millimeters of mercury or a right ventricular end diastolic pressure of more than 10 millimeters of mercury. And a normal pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is usually between 4 and 12 millimeters of mercury. And a normal right ventricular end diastolic pressure is between 0 to 5 millimeters of mercury. So this table um, shows the various hemodynamic parameters with regards to the various types of shock. So um, this one will be for our reference. So I'll just go over the one for cardiogenic shock. So usually in cardiogenic shock, the heart is under a lot of stress and it's not able to pump out blood. So usually congested with blood in all the chambers. So central venous pressure or the right-sided preload will be elevated. Um, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, which represents the left-sided preload, will also be elevated. And because the um, heart is not doing much, um, the cardiac index or LV output will be diminished. And then the systemic venous compensatory mechanism trying to overcome the cardiogenic shock. Then mixed venous oxygen saturation the blood that goes the, the tissue at the tissue level spends a lot of time and that allows the tissue to extract uh, much oxygen. So the systemic, the mixed mm -hmm. venous oxygen saturation will be low in cardiogenic okay. shock. Okay, so now we'll look at the epidemiology of cardiogenic shades ranges from 5% to 10% in patients with acute myocardial infarction. 
you know, what is that tax, a tax steady? Um, cases of cardiogenic shock and ST elevation MI. Um, I didn't show that kid instead of ST elevation MI. I also found out that majority of them, around 42%, were located in the anterior wall. Um, and this was followed closely by the inferior wall of about 38%. And all other sites represented about 19%. Um, comparing ST elevation MI and non ST elevation MI, ST elevation MI is associated with a two fold increased risk of developing cardiogenic shock compared to a non ST elevation MI. With age distribution, is usually common in the elderly. Um, those above 75 are known to suffer cardiogenic shock more often than those below the age of 75. And even though um, coronary artery disease is more common in males. Cardiogenic shock rather has a higher incidence in females. And in terms of race, it's found to be much more common in Asians with um, about 11.4%, followed by Hispanics, whites, and then blacks with an incidence rate of about 6.9%. Okay, so we'll now look at the causes of cardiogenic shock. By far, myocardial infarction is the most common cause of cardiogenic shock. Um, it can also be caused by complications that arise as a result of the myocardial infarction, um, such as ventricular septal rupture, um, papillary muscle rupture, free wall rupture, and cardiac tamponade. Um, I must say that free wall rupture most often results in death. So it's usually diagnosed as a post-mortem di diagnosis, but most of the patients will either die or before reaching the hospital or die um, immediately, um, they get to the hospital. It can also be caused by various forms of arrhythmia, being supraventricular or ventricular arrhythmia. Um, heart failure, especially end stage or dilated cardiomyopathy, myocarditis, and also stenotic valvular heart disease, especially critical aortic stenosis and also severe mitral stenosis. Also, acute valvular regurgitation, again, acute mitral regurgitation and then acute aortic regurgitation can also cause cardiogenic shock. And also in the setting of septic or neurogenic shock with myocardial depression. However, in children, cardiogenic shock presents as a consequence of fulminant myocarditis and also in the setting of congenital heart diseases. So how does this um, condition come about? So in terms of pathophysiology, Cardiogenic shock is recognized as a low cardiac output state, secondary to extensive LV infarction, um, development of mechanical defects, as already mentioned, vascular septal rupture and papillary muscle rupture, and or right ventricular infarction. And autopsy studies have shown that cardiogenic shock is generally observed with a loss of more than or at least 40% of the left ventricular myocardium. Um, so this condition usually okay when most of the LV have been involved, at least 40%. The interruption of um, blood flow due to coronary artery disease causes myocardial, the myocardium to lose its contractile function. Um, if sufficient area of myocardium undergoes ischemic injury, the LV pump function becomes depressed and systemic hypotension then develops. And this eventually leads to a decreased coronary perfusion pressure, um, reduction in cardiac output, as well as increased myocardial oxygen demand. And this play a role in the visual cycle that leads to cardiogenic shock 
and potential death. So at the cellular level, what actually happens? So um, usually we'll have tissue hypoperfusion with con consequent cellular hypo hypoxia, which causes anaerobic metabolism or anaerobic glycolysis. And this eventually leads to the accumulation of lactic acid um, causing intracellular acidosis. And as we all know, acidosis um, causes a reduction in myocardial function or causes um, dysfunction in the myocardium. And it also causes decreased transmembrane potential due to myocyte membrane pump failure. And this eventually leads to intracellular accumulation of sodium and calcium. And that also results in myo myocyte swelling, um, which eventually also will cause a reduction in the function of the myocardium. And if ischemia is severe and prolonged, myocardial cell injury becomes irreversible and leads to myonecrosis. These events induce fracture of the mitochondria as well as the nuclear envelope and plasma membrane. And apoptosis may occur in the very infant, and this may contribute to the myocytes loss. And also activation of inflammatory cascade, oxidative stress, and the stretching of the myocytes um, due to elevated end diastolic pressure will produce mediators that, sorry, that overpowers the inhibitors of apoptosis. That's, um, this will act, activate um, apoptosis to occur. So when all this go on uninterrupted, reversible myocardial dysfunction will eventually ensue. And large areas of myocardium that are dysfunctional, but still viable, can contribute to the development of cardiogenic shock in patients with myocardial infarction. And this potentially um, reversible dysfunction is often described as myocardial stunning or hibernating myocardium. And myocardial hibernation and myocardial stunning are actually difficult to distinguish in the clinical setting, and they most often will coexist. And the mechanism of myocardial stunning involves combination of oxidative stress, abnormalities of calcium homeostasis, and circulating myocardial depressant substances. And by definition, myocardial dysfunction from stunning eventually will resolve completely. Hibernating myocardium, on the other hand, is a state of persistent impaired myocardial function at rest, which occurs because of severely reduced coronary blood flow. And hibernation is an adaptive response to the hypoperfusion and may minimize the potential for further ischemia or necrosis. Um, when revascular, revascularization of the hibernating myocardium generally will lead to an improved myocardial function. And hibernating myocardium improves its vascularization. Hi, hi, sorry, hibernating myocardium improves with revascularization, vascularization, whereas stunt myocardium usually retain anotropic reserve and can respond to anotropic stimulation. So we'll now look at the systemic effects of cardiogenic shock. So when a critical mass of LV myocardium becomes ischemic and fails to pump effectively, stroke volume and then cardiac output are curtailed. The LV pump function becomes depressed and stroke volume, cardiac output and blood pressure declines whilst the end systolic volume um, increases. As we all know, stroke volume um, depends on preload um, contractility as well as the afterload. And the cardiac output um, is usually a factor of stroke volume and then 
heart rate. And blood pressure is also a factor of cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance. Myocardial ischemia is further exacerbated by impaired myocardial perfusion due to hypotension and tachycardia. Um, even though, as, as we mentioned earlier, cardiac output depends on stroke volume and heart rate, in the setting of tachycardia, cardiac output rather reduces. And this happens because um, when, the heart is, when the heart is tachycardic, it doesn't allow enough time for feeling to occur um, for the heart to generate, um, for the heart to be stretched enough to generate adequate cardiac output. So in the setting of tachycardia, cardiac, cardiac output reduces. So what are the compensatory me mechanisms that the body adapts in an attempt to correct the, the ongoing injury? So LP pump failure increases ventricular diastolic pressure, which concomitantly causes additional wall stress and thereby elevating myocardial oxygen requirement. Then systemic perfusion is compromised by decreased cardiac output with tissue hyperperfusion intensifying the anaerobic metabolism. That also leads to the formation of lactic acid or lactic acidosis, which further will deteriorate the systolic performance of the myocardium. And the compensatory mechanisms that the body adapts includes, includes sympathetic stimulation, which tends to increase heart rate. It also increases cardiac productivity. And at the kidney levels, it causes um, sodium and fluid retention. All this in attempt to increase this compensatory mechanism at the initial stages are helpful, but at the long run, they tend to cause initially improve coronary and peripheral perfusion. However, it contributes to increase cardiac afterload and tends to overburden the already damaged myocardium. The elevated heart rate and contractility increases myocardial oxygen demand and further worsens the myocardial. BP will amplify the myocardial afterload, which additionally will impair cardiac performance. And in this factor alpha, uh, additional systemic inflammatory mediators that results in vasodilatation and contributes to mortality in patients with cardiogenic shock. And finally, excessive myocardial oxygen demand with simultaneous inadequate myocardial perfusion worsens myocardial ischemia, and this tends to initiate a vicious cycle that ultimately ends in death unless underlying cause is identified and treated. So this um, schematic diagram summarizes um, most of the things that we've mentioned. So in the setting of myocardial infarction, there is a um, systemic inflammatory response that leads to the production of cytokines in interleukin-6, chemo six factor alpha, and then nitric oxide. Um, at the same time, the myocardial infarction causes my, myocardial dysfunction, which leads to both systolic and diastolic dysfunction. So the systolic dysfunction eventually leads to reduce stroke volume and reduce cardiac output, which in turn causes hypotension, um, systemic reduction in systemic perfusion, um, reduction in coronary perfusion pressure, and then compensatory basal concentration will then occur. 
And all this eventually leads to ischemia and a progressive myocardial dysfunction, which if not interrupted, will lead to the patient's death. The acidic dysfunction on the other hand also leads to elevated left ventricular and diastolic pressure, um, causing increased pulmonary congestion. That also further worsens hypoxemia and also will worsen the state of ischemia. So this is a form of vicious cycle that goes on and ending until the patient dies or when um, an intervention is instituted to correct the ongoing damage. For example, in uh, my other infarction, when revascularization is done to relieve the ischemia, then there's a high chance of patients surviving. So we'll now look at the clinical presentation. How do patients with cardiogenic shock present? As we've mentioned um, earlier, is a medical emergency and a complete clinical assessment is very critical to understand the cause and then targeting um, the needed therapy. So history in this case is very important and history I must say will vary depending on the underlying cause of the shock. So in our history, we want to um, Evaluate the patient for high, high, history of hypertension. We want to find out whether there's a previous cardiac disease. Whether the patient has had MI before cardiac surgery. And also of importance, whether the patient uses cocaine and also cigarettes smoking. We must also evaluate them for other risk factors like hyperlipidemia, left ventricular hypertrophy, or a history of premature coronary artery disease. And by definition, premature coronary artery disease, as we know, is coronary artery disease okay in men before age of 45 and then before age of 55 in women. And usually the presence of two or more of these risk factors will increase the likelihood of um, a patient having an acute myocardial infarction. What are some of the symptoms? Um, usually, patients will present with squeezing or heavy substantial chest pain, which may radiate to the left arm or, or the neck. Pain may be burning, may be sharp, or may be stabbing in nature. If the underlying cause is myocardial um, infarction or myocardial ischemia. Chest pain, you should also note that the chest pain may be presented as a non angina chest pain. And this may be in the form of gastric pain or pain that occurs only in the neck or in the arm. And in some individuals like diabetics and in the elderly, pain may be absent. So absence of chest pain does not exclude um, myocardial injury. And they may also present with angina equivalent like diaphoresis Exertional dyspnea, dyspnea at rest, pre-syncope or syncope, palpitation, general anxiety, or even depression. Um, so these are some of the signs that we may elicit on physical examination. And because of the poor hyperperfusion, patient may be cyanotic. Um, for the same reason, um, because of the peripheral basic concentration, the skin or the extremities may be cold or is usually cold and clammy. And you also have delayed capillary refill time. Most often, they present with tachycardia. The pulse is usually faint and may be irregular in the setting of arrhythmias. The jugular venous, um, mm -hmm. or the jugular vein is usually distended. And their blood pressure is usually, even though not always, usually low, below 90 units of mercury for the systolic blood pressure. They will often have a low pulse pressure. Heart sounds may be distant with a third and fourth heart sound, which may be present. They may have crackles when there is pulmonary edema, but it's not always present. 
um, it's a matter of end organ damage. Patients who usually present with um, um, altered mental status and also decrease urinary output. So by way of investigation, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> A way of investigation with blood workup, full blood count is very important. And with the full blood count, we need to take note of the HB, which may indicate anemia or hypovolemic from loss of blood. Um, also, WBC is also very important. When it's high, it may be an indication of ongoing sepsis. And BUE is also very important may show end organ damage to the kidneys and related LFTs may also show end organ damage in the liver. Um, lactate is usually high in cardiogenic shock and also, it's also a marker of core prognosis is very high. Arterial blood gases is very important to diagnose acidosis and also to know the arterial um, oxygen saturation. Serial troponins, when myocardial ischemia or MI is suspected, it's also very important um, to do and to be repeated every six hours. An NT pro BNP has a high negative predictive value for cardiogenic shock. A positive NT pro BNP. Um, does not give a conclusion to the diagnosis of cardiogenic shock, but when it's ne negative, it makes it very unlikely. Chest X-ray is also very important, and this really helps to exclude other causes of shock and also other causes of chest pain. So on the chest X-ray, you can look out for um, infiltrations in the lung, which may be a pointer to um, a chest infection that may eventually lead to alternate diagnosis like a septic shock. At um, the same time, you may, you may find a pneumothorax or a widening media stenum, which may suggest uh, dissecting aortic aneurysm. ECG is also very important. Um, on the ECG, we need to take note of the rate of the ECG. Um, in certain of arrhythmias, the rate may be high, and then the rhythm is also very important. And then the ST segment changes will help us rule in or rule out myocardial infarction. Echocardiogram is very key. This usually will help us um, know the LB function. It will also help us exclude other causes like cardiac tamponade. Echocardiogram can also be used to assess fluid status of the patient by measuring the inferior cover. And when um, there is an ongoing MI, that will also be evidence in um, abnormal warm on the echocardiogram. Coronary artery angiography is also very important in the setting of myocardial infarction and also cardiac catheterization when where available should be done. So this is an example of a chest X-ray that shows um, a pneumothorax. If you look on the left, you can see that it's darkened with um, no lung markings. So this is a right pneumothorax. So like I said earlier on the X-ray, if you pay attention to the the rhythm of the X-ray, the rates on this X-ray, for instance, there is tachycardia, and on the chest chest leads, you can see ST elevations in V1, V2, V3, V4, and V5. Um, this is an example of an echocardiogram, which shows severe global, global hypokinesia, and you can also see um, a minimal amount of cardiac effusion, not so significant. 
on the right is an um, ultrasound that is showing the plural. The echogenic image here is a plural. And of note is a vertical artifact. These are called B lines or comet tail artifacts and is seen in pulmonary edema. So how do we make a diagnosis? Um, shock is diagnosed after documentation of myocardial dysfunction. Um, this may be from our lab workup or, or from imaging or from ECG and exclusion of alternative causes of hypotension such as hypovolemia, hemorrhage, sepsis, pulmonary embolism, Okay, so this is a, a coronary angi angiogram that shows uh, critical stenosis or severe stenosis of the So these are some of the differentials of a um, cardiogenic shock. Um, it may be myocardial infarction, myocardial ischemia, myocarditis, myocardial rupture, angina pectoris, septic shock, bacteria sepsis, pulmonary embolism, and the rest. So after making a diagnosis of cardiogenic shock, how do we manage the patient? So again, and again, as has been said, it's an emergency involving acute hemodynamic instability that necessitates an immediate resuscitation therapy before it's becomes, um, it causes ir irreversible damage to vital organs. So a good outcome requires rapid diagnosis, prompt initiation of therapy to maintain blood pressure, cardiac output, and also respiratory support and reversal of underlying cause is very key. And if possible, all patients with cardiogenic shock should be managed in an ICU setting. Um, early revascularization and setting of myocardial infarction is the most important intervention for achieving an improved survival rate. And cardiogenic shock may be pre prevented with early revascularization in patients with MI and with required intervention in patients with structural heart diseases. Um, correction of electrolytes and acid-based abnormalities such as hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, and acidosis is also very essential. So our initial management will usually include fluid resuscitation to correct hypovolemia, hypo hypotension, um, unless there is pulmonary edema in which case we have to be very cautious with the use of fluids. A central line may facilitate volume resuscitation and it also provides vascular access for multiple infusions and allow invasive monitoring of central venous pressure. Arterial line is also very important and may be placed to provide continuous BP monitoring. So enhanced catheterization where available may also help guide fluid station. And this is particularly useful if patients require anotropic medications. So as part of the um, resuscitation and, um, and ventilation, percutaneous ozymetry is very important. And um, in the acutely, um, in the acute care states, an SpO2 of above 90% is acceptable. When non-invasive invasive form of oxygenation, <clears throat> sorry, and ventilation is in, inadequate, an invasive ventilation um, therapy will be required. And we should know that positive pressure ventilation may improve ventilation, but it may also compromise venous 
return and reduce preload to the hat. In terms of treatments, um, we have to avoid beta blockers in patients with signs of heart output state. And we should also avoid um, the running and the and um, the adosterone antagonists. This can worsen the hypotensive state. And in patients with cardiogenic shock, um, that is caused by impaired gain the mean arterial pressure and also augment cardiac output. But I must mention here that the phenotropic and visceral pressure support are usually not destination therapy. They are used to support patients um, circulate, circulation as we try to <clears throat> so I said always at the lowest possible dose and adjusted according to the mean arterial pressure and then the blood pressure. The anotropic agents generally improve hemodynamics in these patients, but are not proven to improve hospital survival. <clears throat> so now look at some of the vasopressor um, agents. Um, these include dopamine, no epinephrine, and epinephrine. And they are basically constricting that drugs that help to maintain adequate blood pressure during a life-threatening hypotension. And it also helps to preserve the perfusion pressure. And muscle pressures should be titrated to maintain an ideal um, mean arterial pressure of above 65 meters of mercury. And always an adequate um, intravascular volume is necessary before the initiation of um, anotropic or suppressor agents. <clears throat> Dopamine dose is usually started at um, 5 to 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute and is given IV um, by continuous IV infusion. And the dose must be adjusted according to the blood pressure and other hemodynamic parameters. And if a patient remains hypotensive despite moderate doses of dopamine, then a direct vasoconstrictor like norepinephrine should be started at a dose of 0.5 microgram per kg per minute and also titrated to maintain a mean arterial pressure of at least 65 inches of mercury. So this, this is quite a busy table, but has a lot of information. So we can go through the later. So on the left side, it shows the various mesoprocess and anotropes. Um, it also shows the various receptors, alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2. It shows its effect on the system vascular resistance, effect on heart rate, effect on cardiac output, and also effect on blood pressure. So you can go to this table later. So this is a chart that I compiled for dopamine um, administration. It helps makes our work easy the emergency. As we know, the dopamine is dose in microgram per kilogram per minute. So it depends on patient's weight. And so on this table down here, it shows how to mix the dopamine. So for a standard mix that we use for peripheral veins, we usually we we'll put 400 milligram of dopamine in 250 mils of dextrose or normal saline. And this constitution gives us a meal of this solution will be equivalent to 1.6 milligram of dopamine. 
So when we've decided on the dose to give, so for instance, if you are giving 10 micrograms per kilogram per minute in a 75 kilogram man, this will mean that we have to infuse 26 ml of the solution per hour. Okay, so we can also go through this table later. So next is um, anotropic support. So usually the vitamin, which is a sympathomimetic agent, and also it's a beta one receptor agonist is used. Um, it has some beta two receptor and minimal alpha receptor activity, and it is usually used as a, as a do, at a dose of two to twenty microgram per kilogram per minute. It also has a half life of approximately two minutes. IV dopamine induces significant positive anotropic effects with mild chronotropic effects through the activation of adrenaline cyclase, um, an increase in intracellular cyclic AMP, and therefore increases um, calcium levels, leading to increase in myocardial contractility. It induces mild peripheral vasodilatation, therefore decreases the afterload. And the combined effect of increased anotropy and decreased afterload induces significant increase in cardiac output. So for this same reason, um, use of the vitamin should be given cautiously in patients whose systolic BP is less than 80 millimeters of mercury because of um, the fact that it causes to dilatation. If given in patients with low systolic blood pressure, it will worsen their BP state. And in the setting of acute myocardial infarction, the vitamin use could increase the size of the infarct because of increase in myocardial oxygen consumption. This is also a similar table showing the, the perfusion rates for the, the vitamin per the dose and then the, the weight of the patient. So when um, pharmacological therapy is not sustaining the patient's BP, the next option that must be considered is mechanical circulatory support. And temporal mechanical circulatory support is required as the first line when immediate stabilization is necessary to recover cardiac and other organ systems. And some of these temporal mechanical circulatory support um, include intra aortic balloon pump, um, peritoneal um, levicular assist device. And also ECMO or extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. These devices have a number of um, benefits, and this includes the fact that it maintains end organ perfusion and prevents prog the progression of shock. It also reduces intracardiac failure pressures and also reduces congestion in the lungs. It reduces LV volume as well as reduction of the wall stress and reduction of myocardial oxygen consumption. And this also augments coronary perfusion and it allows time for recovery of sand or hibernating myocardium. And lastly, it also limits the impact size. So intra-aortic balloon pump may be placed as a bridge to a destination therapy such as um, coronary artery bypass grafting. And in experimental animals, intra-aortic balloon pump counterposition decreases preload, it increases coronary blood flow and improves cardiac performance. Unfortunately, the improvement is often only cardiogenic shock. So this slide shows um, some of the mechanical devices. 
So the first one, the, the one labeled A, is um, depicting intra aortic balloon pump. Um, the B is showing um, what's called the impeller. And then C is tandem hat. And the, the last image, the D, is an image of an ECMO. So these are my references. So I'll end here and take comments, contributions, or questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Fosu, for the very lucid presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, please, can we now take comments, contributions? Okay, maybe let me just start. Um, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, we know that the mortality for cardiogenic shock is still very high. And then it's something very difficult to treat or manage. And like it was, we saw even in your presentation, the commonest cause uh, is like it's mostly following myocardial infarction. So most of the literature actually tilts towards okay management of MI. And then we know that uh, because it's the major cause, the uh, prompt reperfusion therapy is very vital in uh, managing uh, these patients. And then other uh, causes could be things like pulmonary embolism, um, tension pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade, myocarditis, um, also valvular diseases, uh, aortic uh, dissection, like you mentioned. I think it's important to uh, look at the intra-aortic balloon pump I don't know if you can go back to that slide and then maybe just shed more light on how um, it, uh, the mechanism, how it works to be able to increase uh, perfusion to organs. I think that's very important uh, to touch on. Then uh, finally, in terms of management of this patient, because it's an emergency, uh, we can see things like, uh, of course, blood pressure will be low in them. And then JVP might be elevated. We might have the Bex triad, which with the muffled sound, if the uh, etiology is from cardiac tamponade. And then other things we uh, should note in our patients is that one, they will need oxygen. And then we need to maintain the oxygen between 94 to 98%. Uh, and then uh, give them as well diamorphine for pain and anxiety. Then as we are giving um, a pain for pain and anxiety, we can also add an antiemetic uh, to their care. And then we there are, there are things we need in the setting of um, cardiogenic shock. There are uh, certain things we actually need to uh, like keep monitoring. We need to, to keep monitoring the central venous pressure. We need to keep monitoring the blood pressure. Arterial blood gas is also important. And then there might be need for um, repetition of the ECGs that we do. Ideally, this patient should actually be on uh, a monitor that's actually uh, providing all of this. Then it's very important to also keep an eye on the uh, urinary output of the uh, uh, patients. Um, thank you very much. So I don't know if you can just maybe shed more light on how uh, the intraaortic balloon pump works to increase or improve perfusion. Thank you very much. Image. So this device and is usually synchronized with the electrical activity of the heart. So it works in conjunction with the, the ECG. So it's able to identify um, the systolic and diastolic phase 
of the heart and um, inflates and deflates accordingly. So during ventricular systole, the balloon deflates to allow the blood to flow from the heart through the aorta. And then it inflates during um, diastole. So when it inflates, it keeps the pressure distal to the bal balloon that is around this side. And that increased pressure helps to improve the, the blood flow to the coronary arteries. So basically that's how it works. It inflates and deflates in response to the activity of the heart. During systole, it deflates. And during diastole, it inflates, um, causing an increase in the intra aortic pressure and um, um, subsequently in, improves coronary perfusion. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. So I don't know whether there are, there are any more contributions or questions. Good evening. Um, thank you for the lucid uh, presentation. I just want to actually ask for a little clarification. I think during the last exam, um, they were talking about the use of the anotropic agent in terms of um, priority. I think most of the time we talk about dopamine topping the chart. But I think the last time we had this topic um, a few months ago, I think somebody was saying that uh, no epinephrine should be number one. They may be followed by dopamine. I'm not too sure. Maybe you came across something like that, just to be able to put them in order of uh, priority. If methylephrine would be one, dopamine would be two, and dopamine would be three. I'm not too sure if there's something like that. Maybe you came across something like that, just to shed a little light on it. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, in terms of the priority, I'm not sure I came across that. Uh, which one should come before the other? Just so, uh, with dopamine and no epinephrine, that I'm, I'm not too sure. I'll try and actually search for a relevant article that I can actually confirm and I'll put it on the central page. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, but is there anybody on the call that I'm not sure about that? Is there anybody on the call that maybe knows? No, because during the last time we had the discussion, I think Dr. Jennifer raised this particular issue and she was trying to um, push for that. Uh, there was a, a paper she read that said um, no epinephrine should like be number one. I just want to confirm so that I'm sure what I'm storing in my head. Thank yeah, you. Yes, I understand. I'm just asking maybe if there's somebody on the call who knows about Yeah, she just mentioned one or two things. Uh, usually controversies, um, the vasopressors that we use basically, um, let me thank the presenter first. Sorry that I'm bumping in like that. Really appreciate um, your presentation. Thank you so much. It was quite um, educative and lucid. Thank you. Um, like I was saying, Dr. Odoi, um, I think uh, most of these things are actually um, patient-specific, um, um, so to say, patient-specific. What you're talking about, I think, of recent to we mentioned something like that. Um, it's just I can't, I'm not sure if I can reproduce the paper for you now, but um, not a problem frame is what we commonly use in this environment. Um, not um, dopamine first, um, although the um, those the ICU people, um, anesthetists, they like dopamine a lot. Well, dopamine is not friendly with the renal status, especially for patients in cardiogenic shock. So um, I wouldn't know what the source is, but also what I know, what we do here in Ibadan is no epinephrine. However, if um, no epinephrine is not um, doing the work, as in despite being or no epinephrine, if the 
patient's um, um, cardiac um, function and is still not able to attain the mean arterial um, pressure greater than 65, like he has said, we do dual um, um, vasopressin um, medication. So usually we day 10 when patient, by the time patient is getting to high CU, they would have, they will have um, dopamine plus no epinephrine. But what we start first, and from the guidelines, is no epinephrine. And uh, that one seems to be more renal friendly. Most things that we'll um, notice is by the time patient gets to high CU, they are having dopamine, renal function starts going down. So it's not really um, as renal friendly as um, no epinephrine. Um, Statement. I think that's the little I can see. But when we read different articles, we see different things, really. So I understand. I also get confused, but that's what I've come to put in my head. So, and I think that was. Thank you. Thank you for shedding more light on it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Imodlade, for the inputs. Thank you. There's a comment in the chat box from Dr. Ruki. Okay, he's thanking the presenter. And then the most common cause of cardiogenic shock in the environment is heart failure as opposed to MI in developed countries. That's why most texts speak of revascularization in the patient with cardiogenic shock. Okay, so she's asking. Any unique management considerations for cardiogenic shock due to heart failure? Is there any unique management considerations for cardiogenic shock due to heart failure? Okay, thank you very much. So, I think usually in the setting of heart failure, um, what we need to support is the patient's um, blood pressure, so um, either dopamine or the vitamin can be used. And I think that that's that's what I came across during my re reading. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, thank you. Just to make a comment on that question, I, I was just thinking, I wouldn't know in our environment where we have heart failure as a predominant cause of cardiogenic shock. Uh, if um, those who meet criteria for CRT, if that could be of help to um, uh, um, help the heart to um, get close to its um, uh, normal function, I wouldn't know because you mentioned something about CRT where you were uh, talking earlier on. So for those who made the indication, uh, at failure, hospital and three and four, the normal sinus reading, uh, like CRS more than, um, I think, um, 15, uh, 0 0.15 uh, seconds, or those with uh, more than 0 0.12, and then also um, level bundle brand block, if that might actually be a bit helpful. Just, I think you, I think there was something like that on, on, on the slide. I'm just wondering if, that would be helpful. I was wondering if anyone could just please respond. Thank you. Sorry, any, anyone with an answer to Odoin's question? Yes, maybe just um, as I did, I was I put on the chat post that we may not um, be dependent on the actual cause of the heart failure. That's what I think is the actual cause. And just like um, seeing the um, cardiogenic shock, what exactly is causing the, the, the shock? So I feel the uh, management really would um, be dependent on what exactly is the cause, because it's not all patients that you need CRT. 
Some don't even qualify for CRC. Some have infiltrative um, heart diseases. Um, you understand? So I think it will really depend on the etiology. Because if, like, for instance, if the patient has a cardiac amyloidosis and presenting in almost like end stage, and now in cardiogenic shock, probably from I've had several arrhythmias, like you see in most of our patients. Uh, majority of them eventually have um, arrhythmia recurrent or even um, stone, and will eventually go into shock, and there will be nothing we can do about it. In those instances, for instance, now, um, even if you give them for suppressors, might not really, really help. So might be maybe what they actually, I don't really know how to say it, so depending on the etiology. If a patient has a valvular heart disease now, you cannot be talking of CRC. So I think um, the main thing is just give supportive treatment, then you treat the etiology of the, of, of the failure. That's what I think would be the correct answer to, to that uh, question. Really. Then, yes, just as a follow-up to what um, Dr. Ruki is putting up, Dr. Ruki, Speak up to us now. This sky um, classification that is talking about um, is also quite um, um, important. Stage um, A, B, C, D, E. Those um, stages also helps in the management of the patient. Really, um, the stage A are those at risk that even before they go into um, heart failure, I posted it before on the group when um, we we're discussing. So we are answering a question on cardiogenic shock and the asking of the criteria in cardiogenic shock. So for A is um, those at risk, B um, is those that are beginning to develop the shock, um, those um, them stage C are those actually in cardiogenic shock, and those are the ones that fulfills all the criteria I has talked about today. Then we have D, those that are deteriorating. That means they've gone past, yes, they were in shock, now they are deteriorating. The stage E are the extremities or, or extremists, so to speak. So they've gone to the extreme, almost going, that would actually require the tandem heart and stuff that I was talking about. And the um, all these the stages at which the patients um, present will actually determine um, the prognosis and um, how we actually manage the patient. Um, but um, the shock in itself are those in stage C. Um, and um, there's something I was going to say now that's kept in. I'm going to say something. Yes, and when we see patients, when patients come in or um, any scenario, a clinical scenario is created, we are supposed to say what um, stage the patient actually is using the SCA high. Um, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ruki. Your comments are noted. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Imoladi. Thanks for the response and for pushing further. Mm. Maybe just to add that for the sky classification, would all, we, it's important to also look at the uh, what's the okay thank you it's important to look at the uh they, they all have you know different uh, physical examination findings and then biochemical parameters and hemodynamics hemodynamic changes in each of the stages from the bottom of the ladder and the pyramid which is the at risk all the way upward Okay, because from um, stage D and E, the deteriorating and extremists, they will have the features you already have in C, which is the classic cardiogenic shock. Okay, like, like their lactate levels, you know, creatinine and um, DNT and urine outputs, all those changes. So, um, like Corey Moladi said, it's, some, it's important to look at this um, closely. Thank you. Any other contribution or comments or inputs?
Okay, it appears there's no more. So I want to thank very specially uh, Dr. George Ofosu for this very brilliant and uh, lucid presentation. Thank you for taking your time to do this and for uh, presenting so excellently. I don't know if uh, Dr. Kopi is around. And... Okay, I can't see him here. All right. Um, can I now hand over to Dr. Ade Andrew? Okay, thank you very much. So I'll just stop this recording now. Thank you.